knowing so certainly it is done, that we say together, and so it is. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I wonder if, if uh, I asked everyone who considered themselves to be an adventurer, an explorer, to raise your hand, how many, how many would do so? I remember when I was a, a little kid, a preschooler, back in the, in the 50s when TVs were huge. Now they're huge again, and all black and white. There was, a t there was a show on for children, and it was called Romper Room. Some of you might remember it, but whoever the lady was who was the host, she had a, a magic, magic mirror that she could look through. And it was just basically a, a handheld mirror with the glass removed, so it was just kind of a, a handle with a ring frame on it. And she would hold that up and she would say, this is my magic mirror and I can look through this and I can see through the TV and I can see who's watching. And then she would call off these names and she would say, I see, I see Johnny and I see Janie and I see Jimmy. And I would go, oh, Jimmy, oh my, she sees me, she sees me. You know, of course, I didn't realize that uh, she was just reading a list of names. But if I had such a device and I could look out and see everyone who's listening or watching and asked how many consider yourselves to be a true explorer, a true adventurer in this thing we call life. I imagine every hand would go up. I imagine everyone would go up enthusiastically, you know, kind of like, kind of like in, in uh, Welcome Back, Cotter. Ooh, 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 pick me, pick me. Because I think that's what brings us collectively brings us as a as community a spiritual community it brings us together it is this is this deep desire this deep desire to to know more of that which already is you know many times people would come to our church for the first time and we, we would ask you know well, what what brought you here to us why are you here and the answers were were generally similar and similar to my own experience as well. And that is, I had questions that weren't getting answered in the traditional dogma and creed of, of the religion of my family, the religion I grew up in. You know, there were, there were just some things that didn't quite make sense, some things that seemed worthy of greater explora exploration. And yet, in, in that environment, you know, as a child growing up in a very rigid environment, an environment of dogma, an environment of creed, typically the questions would not be answered. Not, not that people were mean, they didn't have time or perhaps they didn't have the answers. Reminds me of, um, I told you, when we first moved here to, uh, to Rock Hill, I, I went over to the community college and I took some classes. I was... Uh, trying to get into the uh, TV production program they have over there. And while I was waiting to see if I could get a seat in that, uh, in that program, I took all of the elective courses that you had to take in order to get your degree, the uh, mathematics, the English, and those kind of things. And every classroom that I went into, every one, they had a poster up that talked about the importance of critical thinking. Now, to me, critical thinking is asking, how do you know what you know? How do I know what I know? You know what, what objective facts and data are there? How do I know those facts and data are correct? How do I know that I'm processing them correctly? What other ways are there to view this particular thing that we're discussing or discovering? What might I learn from exploring other viewpoints, even the viewpoints I don't agree with? You know, How do I protect myself against my own... Uh, my own bias confirmation. To me, that's critical thinking. Every classroom I went into had a poster, you know, that, that the mission of the, of the school was to develop critical thinkers. And yet, every classroom I went into did not practice it, did not demonstrate it, because there was a curriculum to be followed, there was a time schedule to be adhered to, there was a certain amount of information that, that needed, to be, uh, needed to be covered that particular day. And of course, this is how the teachers were rated, you know. And there was just enough information and just enough time that, that there wasn't time to stop and raise your hand and say, I would really like to discuss that issue. I would really like to discuss that point. You know, there were some fascinating things that came up, things that 
I hadn't thought about in years, you know. For example, in mathematics, uh, one thing that just pops to my mind, there was a, a great, a great discussion, if you will, in the textbook, uh, or, or a great importance weighed on the discovery of zero in mathematics. Now, that seems, <laughs> seems kind of a no-brainer, you know. You know when you have nothing, you know when you don't have any of something, you know, what, why, why was it so difficult to, uh, to think in terms of zero? But apparently that was a great breakthrough in mathematics. And I would have loved to, to, to explore that. I would have loved to, to go back and say, wait a minute, it, you know, this is counterintuitive. This doesn't make sense. Maybe the symbol of the zero was discovered, but the concept, you know, the idea of nothing, of not having any, you know, how many sheep do you have? I, I don't have any. Well, that's zero. You know, well, no, it wasn't zero because somebody, somebody came to a different interpretation of it in terms of arithmetic, in terms of working with numbers. But my point is I would have loved to explore that idea, you know, and I would have loved to have found out more because it just, do, it just doesn't quite make sense to me that people did not understand the concept, the, the concept of the null set, if you want to call it that. But we didn't have time. We didn't have time to go into it or to discuss it. You know, sure, you could go home and you could get on the internet and you could Google. But as far as a group, as far as a group of students coming together for the purpose of exploring and discovering, it just wasn't there. It just wasn't there because we had to get through that day's assignment. We had to get ready for whatever the test was. We had to take the test and pass the test so we could get on to our, to our next class. And in, and in some respects, when it comes to our spiritual growth, to the organizations or the homes that we grew up in, we got a lot of that. And that may be appropriate. It may be exactly what we needed at that point in our spiritual development, you know. But we asked questions and we didn't get answers, you know. And of course, the greatest question uh, in, in any religion, in any philosophy, becomes the, what is the philosophers and, and the theologians call the problem of evil, which is if God is so good, where does pain and suffering come from? You know, how could a good God create such a thing, send such a thing, or allow such a thing? And personally, I believe you will learn more about someone's religion by listening to the answer of that question than, than you will in studying dogma and creed and memorizing, memorizing quotes of scripture and, and all those kind of things. To me, that's a fundamental question, maybe the fundamental question. So I think there's a natural curiosity. There's a natural curiosity. Today's topic is about what do you think the greatest discovery is? And is it, is it the ultimate greatest, or will there be a greater discovery? And how did we get to this discovery? What led us to this discovery? And is it, is it our very nature to discover? Is it our very nature to explore? And I think it is. I think there's, <coughs> excuse me, I think there is something innate within each and every one of us that wants to ask questions, that wants to challenge um, the existing views. When, when somebody gives you an existing view, like they just arbitrarily say the concept of zero was invented in, on such and such a date, you know, in such and such a place. And there's part of us that wants to go, wait a minute, how do you know that? You know, that sounds like you're making that stuff up. How do you know that? We want to we wanna ask questions. We want to explore. We want to have answers. This is our great curiosity. In, uh, <clears throat> in Fenwick Holmes' biography of his brother Ernest, he says that their mother called Ernest the great question mark because he was always exploring, he always had questions, he always wanted to know more, you know. That's kind of what led him to his, his discovery and his development of his own philosophy, which he called the science of mind. We want to know, inquiring minds want to know, we want to know. So think about this. In the textbook, Dr. Holmes, tells us what he, his view of the greatest discovery is. And if I asked you, what do you think the greatest discovery of humanity so far as, you know, as far as we know, 
what is the greatest discovery? You know, is it the light bulb? Is it is it power? How to use power? Is it locomotion? You know, is it the airplane? Is it the ability to grow more food on a, on a, an acre of land than we ever knew before? What is the greatest discovery of humanity? And Dr. Holmes tells us, this is his view, his opinion, that the greatest discovery that human beings have ever made is mind. M-I-N-D, mind. The greatest discovery. He goes on for a couple of re uh, with a couple of reasons about this and a, and a couple of interesting ideas to explore. You know, like what is this thing called mind? We, and we don't know. And he tells us we don't know. He says the greatest the greatest thinker alive doesn't know what mind is, and no one has ever ever plumbed the depth of it. No one has ever found the end of it. You know, where 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 is it? Where does it come from? Where does it go? How does it work? What does it do? All of those kind of questions. But at some point in the evolution of human beings, human beings discovered they could think. They di well, they discovered that they were thinking, let's put it that way. And, it, and of course, this corresponds with what we had been studying in Richard Maurice Buck's work on cosmic consciousness. You know. He says, at some point in the process of evolution, self-consciousness arose. The, the creatures that existed at the time, our, our ancestors, suddenly became aware that they were aware. Now, we've talked about this on and off a couple weeks, different ideas coming in. You know, there's instinct. The animals, the animal level of consciousness which exists within us, right, it functions on instinct. It knows, but there is no awareness of its knowing. Any example in the human body is if you eat a certain amount, certain kind of food or a certain amount of food, there's something within the body that, that is capable of dealing with that perfectly. You know? Dr. Bales, in trying to help us to understand just how magnificent our life is and the creation of, of our bodies is, he asks us to consider, you know, if, if you were injured and you lost a pint of blood, would you know how much water to drink or how much salt to take or, or what kind of foods to eat in order for your body to replenish that pint of blood? And if we had to do it consciously with our intellect, we, we wouldn't be able to do it. You know, we could say, well, I'll drink more water and I'll have more salt. But would you know exactly how much, you know, would you know why? And yet there's something within us that knows and it adjusts our appetite. It adjusts our appetite in such a manner that we desire the very things that we need to eat and drink in order for the body to heal. That's what I'm talking about by instinct. It's there. It operates. It functions well. But we are totally con in our consciousness, our awareness, we are not aware of how it works. We, we couldn't control it. As far as we know, we couldn't control it if we tried. You know? Instinct guides the animals on thousands of miles of migration ac across open spaces you know, at the perfect time for the migration. And yet if you, if you could stop one of these little birds in flight and say, hey, wh where are you going and, and, and why? they wouldn't be able to tell you. The monarch butterflies that complete, the, complete their migration over several generations. You know. So one generation is born in a, in a valley in Mexico and heads out and flies north up the, up the west coast of our continent. And goes all the way up to Canada and turns, comes down the east coast and goes back to Mexico. But the generation that left dies off along the way. And yet somehow, somehow in the, <coughs> somehow in the butterflies of succeeding generations, they find their way back to a place they never were. They find their way back to a home that they have no conscious memory of ever having been to. Instinct, isn't that mind-boggling? 
life appeared on this planet, life evolved on this planet. And the mystics will tell us that consciousness was involved from the beginning. It's not like consciousness suddenly appeared. It's like consciousness was there trying to find an outlet, trying to create an outlet, trying to express itself and find a way to express itself until at some point this thing that we call self-consciousness appeared and human beings became aware of thought, became aware of the concept of I, became aware of the concept of self and became aware of the ability to think and then manipulate thoughts and then work with thoughts and then put thoughts together and, and then all within all within this this process we call thought to pose questions and to get answers to those questions to invent things to think of things that did not yet exist and then to be able to take hands and tools, perhaps paper and pencil, or charcoal on a wall, you know, and make symbols, and assign meaning to the symbols, and, and, then, and then convey the meaning of that symbol to somebody else. So that when different people looked at the same symbol, they had a general understanding of each other. Language, writing, hieroglyphics. Amazing, an amazing evolution of this thing called mind. And Dr. Holmes tells us that he thinks that that is the greatest discovery. The greatest discovery is mind. Because in discovering mind, we, we developed a sense of being, a sense of awareness, a sense of an awareness of the fact that we are. And then using this ability to think, we were able to start to probe the depths, the depths of the workings, the workings of thought. He said, we, <laughs> our thoughts seem to go somewhere and then they seem to come back to us. And we call that memory. And I, I often chuckle to myself when I kind of think about what, what is memory, you know? It's like we know it, but we don't have access to that knowledge for a while, you know? <laughs> what was that guy's name, you know? Who was that that, that played for the, for the Yankees? All these different things that we know that we know and yet, temporarily, it's not there. And then it comes back to us. Well, where was it? Where was it, you see? How does this thing called memory work? <coughs> and if we, if we play with that idea long enough, what we find is that the difference between actually having an experience and having an imagined experience, right? The, the difference between memory and imagination is memory is trying to re recall something that <laughs> that we experienced in the past. And remember, the only place we can experience it is in our consciousness, in our thoughts. We don't experience a thing, we experience what we think of it. And then imagination we project into the future. And I remember um, the, the little bit that I studied psychology when we were talking about how it's, it's difficult for, for humans to actually separate what really happened in, what, in an imagination or a false memory, you know. You've probably heard the experiments where they took basketball players and they had some basketball players go out to the court and practice shooting from the foul line every day. And then they had other basketball players who just imagined that they were standing there shooting at the foul line every day. Just they, they rehearsed in their imagination, but they didn't physically go out and do it. And then they had others who just, just were distracted and they went and they did something else. They kept their mind off of basketball. And when they brought them back in to retest them, well, the ones who had done something else, you know, they hadn't improved the ones who practiced every day shooting basketballs, well, they did improve, but the ones who only practiced in their mind, 
improved almost as much as the ones who had actually gone out and done it every day. So we, we, have, we have these memories and we have these imaginations and at some point it all blends together and we think that is our reality. And yet what we think is our reality is just an amalgamation of concepts that we call our own, that we call our own. So if we, if we think about thinking about, and that's why, that's why I say this is a teaching, not a preaching, for people who like to think about what they're thinking about. If we start to think about that, we say, wait a second, we, we really don't know. We really don't know. What we think we know, we don't know. It's only our concept of something that we know. And this is fascinating. This is most fascinating. Because each of us has this, this illusion, if you want to call it, that this, this mental image, this world point of view, that is just entirely based upon thought. Just entirely based upon thought. Now, Dr. Holmes told us that mind was the greatest discovery for another reason. He said what, what happens is, eventually, we realize that what, what the predominant things that we were thinking, that by... By changing our thinking, we can change our life. That there is something that acts upon our beliefs. And once we learn how to, I won't say control, but let's say direct. Once we learn how to direct our lines of thinking, once we learn how to direct our thoughts, then we start to have a different experience in life. And then this entirely goes to the New Testament where we're told it's done unto you according to your belief. And when you pray, pray believing in your hearts. And it shall be. It shall be. Right? Then that leads us to, to ask even deeper questions of, well, what is belief? And how do I know what I believe? You know, do I have beliefs that, that function below my level of conscious awareness that are, in effect, being acted upon by whatever this power is that responds to us according to our belief? Is the life that I lead a result, as you know, as Freud said, of, of unconscious impulses? Now we really start to get into the curiosity, you see. Now we really start to get into this, whoa, wow, what is this thing called life? And how does this thing called life work? And how important is this thing called thinking? So Dr. Holmes said the greatest discovery was mind. And I would, I would invite you to consider that the greatest discovery is perhaps curiosity. Perhaps curiosity. Because without curiosity, we would not have discovered mind. Something within someone, something within ourselves has to say, well, wait a minute, what, what is this thing called? What is that? What is this thing called an idea? Where did that come from? Where does that go? You see. What does it do while it's here? Whose thought was that? Whose, whose thought came across this field of consciousness? This curiosity leads us to, to not only want to learn more about how this thing called mind functions and how we can cooperate with it so that we can we can have a greater experience of life, to explore life more fully. But to understand, well, who, who is the one who is curious? Who is the one who is observing these thoughts, observing the thinker? So now, all of a sudden, what happens is within, within this own concept of, of who I am, of I, there seems to be a couple of people running around in there. There's the one doing the thinking, or at least we think there's one doing the thinking, because we own the thoughts. We say, well, I had a thought. Well, that's my thought, you see. And then there's the one becoming aware of the thought. Now, are these two different entities? Are these two different beings? Is there somebody else inside my head? Or are these two parts of the same whole? Am I becoming aware of something? 
if I am the one having the thought and I am the one becoming aware that I am having the thought, there's one possibility. But then there's two aspects of, of myself acting independently, you see? Like the, the good, the angel and the devil, one on each shoulder. Or maybe the thoughts are not my thoughts, you see? Maybe thoughts are thoughts. And I am becoming aware. And the I that is becoming aware is the field of consciousness. It is the one who is becoming aware, or, if, or as and the Buddhists would tell us in meditation, the witness, the witness. You see, you are not the thought, but you are the witness or the observer of the thought. So now our curiosity has led us to discover mind. We don't know what it is. We don't know how far it goes. We can't measure it. We can't weigh it. You know, consciousness philosophers still discussing what consciousness is. There was a, a headline in my news feed this morning. I haven't read the article, but again, it's about consciousness. What is consciousness? Where does consciousness come from? Is consciousness something created accidentally by chemical reactions in a brain? Or as the mystics would tell us, was consciousness involved in matter from the very beginning and it just took billions of years for it to develop a suitable physical organ to express through, which we would call the human being, the human brain. So curiosity then, I would say, is even, even more important than this thing that we call mind, although you might argue that curiosity is an aspect of mind. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to tell you it's not. I, I sure don't know. But it is this desire to explore. It is this, this desire to learn more. It is this desire to, to understand that which is in itself <laughs> can't be understood. It is, this, it is this curiosity that I would say is an even greater discovery. Because once we discover the curiosity, now we can direct the curiosity. See, now we can, we can <clears throat> make a choice. Now how do we make a choice? Where are we making a choice? Somewhere in mind. So there's a part of mind that decides what mind wants to know, but then there's another part of mind, big M mind, collective unconscious mind. There's a part that already knows and then seems to reveal it. Reveal that which is already known. This is why we call it a discovery, right? We did not invent electricity. We did not create electricity. We discovered electricity. Electricity has always been there. It will always be there as a fundamental, fundamental property of nature. But somewhere along the line, using the intellect, using curiosity, using experimentation in the labs, you know. Ohms and Faraday and all of these, all of these pioneers have been able to tame it, if you want to call it that, and have been able to put it into an environment where we could use it. And their visioning, you know, required electric wires running everywhere. And then Tesla came along years later and had a revelation, so we don't need electric wires, we can do this wirelessly, working with rhythms, working with cycles. And he did, if he went to Colorado Springs, Colorado in 1900, and I don't know how he did it, but he was able to uh, light electric lights positioned some great distance away from a generating station, somehow. But through his curiosity, through through his desire to know, through the information that came to him, which he said was a revelation. He didn't take credit for it. It was not like I sat down and made this happen. It was like he had an intention to know, a desire to know, and something revealed that information to him. And of course, from, from, his, from his curiosity, we get all kinds of things, microwaves, microwave communication, laser beams all these sorts of things. But they already existed, that's my point. The principles of electricity, the principles of microwave transmission, all of these things are there 
and they exist. And we discover it. We discover it. Now here's, here's kind of an amazing thing to consider. And I realize I'm going deep today and I hope that you spend the, the rest of the week and the rest of your life kind of rolling these things over because to me they're the very stuff and substance of our spiritual growth. Whatever we are, as complex as we are, as complex as our consciousness is, we do have the ability to set an intention, to, to select, to choose that which we would know, that which we would have, that which we would do. Of all the different possibilities out there, we are able to choose one. And when we listen to the, um, to the lectures of, of people who have merged kind of merge quantum physics and the philosophy of mind or the philosophy of consciousness together. You know, it starts to sound very similar. I watched a video this week on uh, David Bohm, who was a, a physicist who then kind of, uh, kind of overlapped with spirituality. And uh, he had some great dis discussions with Krishnamurti of India, the two of them, one a mystic and one a physicist showing how the, the, two, <laughs> the two disciplines kind of merge together. But in, in the terms of quantum physics, you have all of these different probabilities and they collapse into one. They collapse into one thing at the moment, temporarily at the moment. They collapse and they take this particular form at this particular time. And you think in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of choosing, in terms of setting our intention, there's all these possibilities you could choose Anything. You can choose anything you want, you know. And then that range of possibilities, that wave of possibilities collapses into one thing, one thing. This is what I shall have. This is what I want to have happen now. And then Dr. Holmes tells us when we make that decision, when we have that intention, and he gives us a step-by-step -step process to go through <clears throat> for affirmative prayer, but when we make that intention, it goes somewhere, or it seems to go somewhere, and something acts upon it and returns to us. In the words of Isaiah, my words shall not return unto me void. In the words of the New Testament, you cast your breads upon the water, and they shall return unto you. In the words of Florence Scovel Shin, life's a game of boomerangs. What you toss out, you're going to get back, you see. We start to, we start to learn that. We start to start to say, wait a second, when I change my thinking, when I change my attitude, when I change the way I look at the world, the world changes the way it looks back at me. This is some sort of a power of the soul. This is something that goes beyond our understanding of the physical. Yet our understanding of the physical is only a thought. And we can choose whatever thoughts we wish to have. So the first thing <coughs> I would like to suggest, I would like <coughs> us to consider today, is that we as human beings in, in our culture, in Western society, we have spent, you know, say from, from the mid-1400s or so, we have spent <coughs> a great deal of time sort of enamored with thought, enamored with the intellect. I think, therefore I am, <clears throat> in the words of Descartes. Science, experimentation, and all of these things <clears throat> become most important, and, we, and we've almost made a uh, sort of a faith or a religion out of, out of thinking. And yet the thinking in itself is not, always <laughs> is not always accurate. It is not always valid. And in a little video I was watching this week, David Bohm said something that just kind of <laughs> took me back. And he said, when thought <clears throat> begins to deceive itself, it becomes dangerous. It becomes dangerous. And I said, wow. And where he was going with that is, is that 
as we become aware of thinking, as we become aware of thoughts, we own them. These are my thoughts. And he says, perhaps we don't own them any more than we own the sunrise, <clears throat> the sunrise or the sunset. We could say, well, that's my sunrise because I'm the one seeing it. But it is just the sunrise. And maybe thought is just thought. See? <clears throat> and maybe instead of them being my thoughts, they are just thoughts that I, the witness, am observing. And what Bohm was saying is, is when we take ownership of these thoughts, when we believe that we are these thoughts, then suddenly what happens is we have a desire for them to be right. Self, Self-confirmation, bias. We ignore things that disagree with what we already believe. We accept, we accept without much challenge information that agrees with what we want to believe. We reject as, as rumors and fake news and all of that information that disagrees with that which we already believe. And we justify anything, see? We justify anything. We justify war. We justify dropping bombs on innocent people. We, we justify expanding territories and taking over lands in order to preserve our way of life. And all peoples do this. All, you know, over time, they do this. And what gives them permission to do that but thinking? But thinking. They create this justification in their head that they're entitled to whatever it is. Or in some cases, they create the justification in their head that their God gave them permission to do this. And what is that but a thought, you see? What is that but a thought? So when thought deceives itself, when thought deceives itself, it becomes dangerous. And I thought to myself, wow. Wow. So we have this curiosity, you see. We've discovered that there's this thing called thinking. We don't really know what it is, but we've discovered this thing called thinking. <clears throat> I, I told you about a, a philosopher of mind. I, I read a, an article about him, and I thought the article was great, and then I went and got his, his book, which was written for scientists with lots of uh, references to research papers and <clears throat> research that, of course, I have no knowledge of. And I couldn't understand a word he wrote. But he said, now this is a, this is a contemporary of ours, Peter Carruthers. He said, rather than, than owning the thought and thinking that is my thought, maybe what we should think about is, is there is a field of awareness. And we become aware of thoughts that appear in our field of awareness. Now this is exactly, exactly what the Eastern mystics have been telling us for thousands of years. Become the witness. Identify with the observer. Become the witness. Don't become entangled with your thoughts. So I think the first thing as we start to grow, there's, <clears throat> there's a step that Dr. Holmes points out to us is that we become aware of thinking and we become aware that, that directed thought is more powerful than than scattered thought. And something acts upon those thoughts. Something acts upon those thoughts. We live in a spiritual universe and it is done unto us according to our belief. And as we become aware of that, then it becomes important to us to become aware of what we are thinking and to guide or shepherd those thoughts into a constructive rather than a dangerous or destructive manner, as Bohm tells us. Right? Pay attention. This is where mindfulness comes in. So now we're going to move into mindfulness. Mindfulness is being aware in the moment, at every moment, to be aware. And I think that being aware is probably the next step that we take. Once we become convinced of the importance of which thoughts we identify with and which thoughts we claim and which thoughts we hold on to. We become aware that as we, as we develop our intention, as we set our intention and we say, this is what I shall know, that information finds its way into our field of awareness. For example, as Tesla might say, a revelation. But then we want to become aware every moment of every day, even in our sleep, even through the, through the 
the yoga of sleep and dreaming. We want to be aware all the time. See, every moment there's stuff coming into our field of awareness, you know. And I think it's, it's Don Miguel Ruiz, and he probably wasn't the first one to say it. But that which we don't reject, we've accepted. If it's just there, and we don't say no, it's as if we have said yes. It's as if we have said yes. So we want to develop this awareness of what we, you know, not stopping thoughts, but which ones do we identify with? Which ones do we say, oh, that's me. Oh, yeah, that's mine. I did that. That's my thought. Because they're the ones that, de that <clears throat> determine our lives. And there are thoughts that we have that we, we have below a level of awareness that are determining our lives. And we want, to, we want to neutralize those by constantly taking the thoughts that we want to have, the positive thoughts, and entertaining them. Yeah. Kind of like your garden, you know. If you, don't, if you don't go out and take care of your garden, pretty soon it's going to be full of weeds. Now, there's nothing wrong with weeds. Weeds are the perfect plant for that soil at that time, but they may not be the one that you want. They may not be the ones that you need. So if you're trying to grow tomatoes and they're surrounded by weeds, you need to go out with a hoe and you need to knock back the weeds. So consider your, your creative mind to be this fertile soil that has been, has been left open, has been left exposed, and you have planted the seeds of what you want in there, but now you need to go in and make sure that you don't create any room for the weeds, right? So in gardening, rather than go out and, and take the hoe to the ground every, every week, you can put mulch over the soil. You can put down a thick coating of mulch, let your tomato plants stick up and put the mulch all around them. And that mulch serves the purpose of keeping the weeds out. So what you want to do is, is, is in your daily life, in your awareness, as you become aware of the thoughts that are going through your mind, you also want to be putting down this thick layer of mulch of your positive thoughts. All the time. You know, not just 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening, but all day long. All day long. What thoughts am I aware of right now? Are they the ones that... I want to be aware of? Are they the things that I want to appear in my life? And can I put down that layer of positive thoughts to remind myself there's only God and God is good. There's only life and life is good. So I think we're going to bring this <clears throat> to a close here for today because we don't have enough time to to actually finish the, the last and, and probably the most important, important idea, which is to move beyond thoughts, to move beyond thinking, to move into being, into the isness, and into the suchness. But for now, for now, I invite you this week, I invite you to, to really take some time, really take some time. How curious are you? <laughs> how, much, how much do you want to know? What do you want to know? Are you an explorer? Or are you an adventurer? You know, I've said this before. One of my, uh, my favorite movies, uh, Wendy and I were talking about Tom Hanks earlier, and, and personally, I think he's been, he's been good in most everything I've seen him in. But in Forrest Gump, he wasn't curious. In Forrest Gump, he simply did what he was told. If Mama said it, he did it. If Lieutenant Dan said it, he did it. If the drill sergeant said it, he did it. He did it. If Jenny said it, he did it. And to me, that's the irony of the movie. He went through this life just great. <laughs> Better than any of us could hope to do. <clears throat> but just doing what he was told. But you see, that's not the way our spiritual life works. We have to ask. We have to explore. This thing that we call God is greater than, <clears throat> more vast than our human mind can comprehend. You and I as spiritual beings will be exploring it forever and ever and ever and never be done. So what I'm inviting us to do 
<clears throat> today, we will continue next week. What I am inviting us to do is to take seriously, to take seriously our role as an adventurer, a spiritual adventurer in the unexplored territory of mind. I'll leave you with this thought of self-reflection until next week. You have 24 hours in a day. That's all we all have in this experience. And we sleep part of it. And we work part of it. And we eat part of it. What percentage of that 24 hours of every day are we spending being aware? Being aware. Being mindful. Being in the moment. Even when we're sleeping, we can do this. Being mindful. Being in the moment. Just being aware of what is in our field of consciousness. If during this week, if you can take some time, take whatever you can. Start with five minutes a day, ten minutes a day, an hour a day, whatever you can. Just be still and know. Just sit and be aware. Don't judge it. <laughs> Don't try to change it. Right? Just be aware. Imagine that you're in a room and a TV set is on and you just sit down and you're just aware of the show. Just be aware. Bohm said it's as if, as, if, as if thought is putting on a show and observing the show and then thinks that the show is real. It's like Nurse Betty, you know, the, the lady... Renee Zellweger, her character, Nurse Betty, believed the soap opera was real and she was that character in the soap opera. We believe we are the characters in the soap operas that have been created in our field of consciousness. And we believe it's real and it's only thought. It's only thought. So take some time this week to break the pattern. Observe what's going on. Just observe. Don't form any opinions about it. Just observe. And we'll come back together next Sunday, 11 o'clock, and pick up with moving 